Good morning, everyone, and welcome to session four, Peace, Education, and Social Justice. The previous session on the arts could not have been a better segue to this session, because as we were entertained by that session, we all had to wonder somewhere if the world were just full of art and music and dance, would we not have peace, would we not be educated, and would we not all promote social justice? So I'm very grateful, as I'm sure you all are, of that segue to our program. We will begin with Dr. Mary Shepherd Wong, who was a Fulbrighter in both Hong Kong and Burma, and is a professor and director of TESOL at Azusa Pacific University. And she'll talk about peace and justice in Myanmar. Then we will have Julia Pataki, who's an Austrian Fulbright scholar and works at the Federal Cultural Institute of Germany, the Goethe Institute USA. And she will talk about promoting lasting peace through international education. Next will be Sarah McLuhan, who is a Fulbright teaching assistant in Morocco and is a program officer for the Fulbright, for Fulbright at the United uh, US Department of State. And she'll talk about promoting peace and justice through English language instruction. And then for those of you whose appetite for travel was just whetted again by the previous panel, we have Marianne Stanton, who did a Fulbright in New Delhi, and who is also the chair of the Fulbright, Fulbright Travel Task Force and a director on both the Fulbright Association National Board and the Minnesota chapter. Our panelists will follow one another in succession and the order that I have just given, and we welcome you. Dr. Wong, we are ready to begin. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for that, Stacy. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'm hoping thumbs up. Can you see my screen? All right, so good. All right. Well, um, again, thank you to Fulbright for this amazing experience. I'm currently serving as a English language specialist for Vietnam. So I guess my service is continuing and it's just been so exciting. But let me launch into this. So this presentation is in response to a question that started during my, um, my Fulbright in 2016. <laughs> I was at Yangon University <clears throat> and I asked, how can I help teachers promote peace building in Myanmar? What can be done to bridge the divide be in, between education and the peace process? And what is the role of teachers in promoting peace in light of the ongoing conflicts in Myanmar? While a number of organizations are working on peace building in Myanmar, there are a few that are working directly with teachers and asking them to think about how their practices and their pedagogies are undermining peace and how they might change what they're doing and the content to better support peace. So a little background on Myanmar, just really quick, reconciliation among ethnic groups, I'm sure you know, has been a an ongoing challenge uh, for Myanmar. It has one of the notorious distinctions of having one of the longest civil wars in history. So these workshops were launched um, in response to what Higgins and others state is a stark divide between the national peace process and the education reforms that are going on. So just a quick overview of three sets of workshops that I am going to be talking about today. Um, so I came home from my Fulbright in 2016, and I was able to get grants. 14 points at 28,195. Oh, <laughs> I was able to get grants to return in 2018, 2019, and 2020. So I'm going to describe those briefly. So um, in 2018, I got a grant from the U.S. State Department and World Learning to do a two-day workshop for 30 young teachers in Mandalay. And um, it was called Pedagogies of Peace. 
Then in 2019, I got to return and I did a series of lectures called Research in Peace in Myanmar. Two days, um, two days of sessions, both at Mandalay University and in a town called Medjina in Kachin State in Myanmar. And then in 2020, um, actually this year, right, in January before the onset of COVID really, I did four days of workshops at Mandalay University uh, with 40 faculty members from all different departments. And this was supported by the United Board for Christian Higher Education in Asia and Pai Up University in Thailand. So that was just an overview. So just to go a little deeper into each one, the Pedagogies of Peace project, um, I don't know if some of you might have heard of Alumni Ties. Alumni Ties is a wonderful opportunity for anyone who's done a State Department supported initiative, um, a Fulbright or other initiative. And um, at this Alumni Ties event, we received training and we were networking. We we're offered the chance to apply for a $10,000 uh, grant and I did and I got it and so we went back and you can see the photo on the top that's at the Jefferson Center at Mandalay um, in Mandalay and uh, the, the consulates and the embassies were so supportive giving us the space and we flew in some people from um, we wanted to have minorities involved so we, we flew them in from Gina and other places uh, we also bus several in we put them in hotels for a couple nights um, and it was just a fantastic uh, session with with all of these um, students it, it worked out really well um, <clears throat> you can see our objectives were we wanted after the workshops that they would be able to describe and articulate the importance of peace building and their role in it. Also that they would design a peace building activity that they actually um, demonstrated to everyone uh, at the, the last day and that we could give feedback to. Um, also that, that they would use the activity in their classroom and context, they would uh, evaluate its impact. And we all joined a private Facebook group for six months after the event where we would discuss it and upload photos of what we did. Um, you can see here the wonderful book on the right. Um, this is called Conflict and Peace, Understanding Conflict in Myanmar by Moat U, a wonderful publisher. Um, we had this book both in English and in Burmese, and all of the examples are from Myanmar. So it was a wonderful textbook to have in, in both languages. The four facilitators you see, or I guess a five, sorry, um, four of them are Fulbrighters and one works for Moat U, this, this organization. So it was just, it was such a positive and unique experience getting to know these young people and their passion for peace and just hearing about what they're doing already. Um, and they actually had peace clubs back at their universities and schools where they were working. So it was just, it was just really um, exciting to kind of come alongside and, and hear about the work they were already doing and to um, empower them to do even more. We had two written evaluations and both of them just kept saying, we want more. We wanted more days, more people. We want part two, when are you coming back? Um, so it really uh, in, inspired me to try to do more. And again, yeah, to come back. Here's some more photos you can see of the different events that, that, that we did in their presentations. I'm actually in contact with many of these um, individuals. Uh, we go back each year to Myanmar. Um, my husband's from Myanmar and speaks the language, so that really helps. Um, <clears throat> not all participants <clears throat> provided evidence that they were <clears throat> actually able to use the activities in their context, but most of them did on the Facebook page, so that was exciting. All right, I'm gonna to move to the next one, so I don't wanna run out of time. So uh, the next one I called Researching Peace in Myanmar. And um, I learned something. If you apply for a grant, um, don't buy your plane ticket until, <laughs> until you get the grant. Because <laughs> we bought our plane tickets ahead of time because they were cheaper. <laughs> and then the grant, we got the grant, but then it was delayed until 2020. So we ended up paying for this one ourselves, but that was fine. We had such a wonderful time. We had a 10 day trip. And I contacted the universities. And since I wasn't on a grant, I could do what I wanted. And I said, what would you like me to speak on? And the university said, we want help in researching. And I said, can I focus on researching on social justice and peace? And they said, fine. So we were both happy and that's what I did. And it was, a, it was an exciting time. Here you can see pictures of, um, I was in uh, Medina. We got to, we had three days. So I would have two days of speaking and interacting with students 
um, giving them ideas, hearing their ideas, fleshing out a research plan. I visited local schools and talked to teachers and talked to students. Um, it was just uh, an exciting, and both of the institutions that I went um, were very uh, appreciative, right, uh, of what we did, and we had very good evaluations. You can see a picture here. This is a very interesting town. It's um, We went to a university called KTCS. It's a private Christian college of about 900. Medina is 90% Christian, and it's in the country of Myanmar, which is 90% Buddhist. And this particular area, unfortunately, has a very high rate of drug addiction for young people. So with all of those interesting facts. It was a very interesting place to go. And they were very receptive of, of learning how they could be researching peace so important to their everyday lives, because there are ongoing conflicts in this region. It's one of the, the conflict zones. So then we went back to Mandalay, <laughs> safe Mandalay. Um, and at Mandalay University, uh, I got to interact with these wonderful uh, graduate students who were working or preparing to work on their theses and just talked about research and um, research ideas that maybe support social justice or peace initiatives. And I got to meet with students. Um, and uh, you know, the outcomes included, they had a heightened awareness of the knowledge and the skills of the attitudes needed to conduct studies that explore the promotion of peace building and reconciliation in education, and mostly using qualitative research and participatory action research. So um, moving on to my third and last workshop that I'll discuss. <clears throat> so this one was called um, Peace Building Across the Curriculum. And you know, it was a four day workshop. It was 20 hours, it provided 40 educators, all professors with skills to identify and dismantle educational practices that erode peace and then envision and create and implement practices that support peace. Um, you can see here, we're doing two activities. The one on the top is the gallery walk. What would peace look like in Myanmar? And on the bottom, we did a human knot that just um, really united these professors. You know, we had professors from 19 different departments, zoology, geology, philosophy. So. It was, it was just amazing to bring them all together and to have them think about peace. What does peace have to do with geology? What does peace have to do with, with well, international relations? That was a fun one, right? Um, and I, I should say, you can see on the bottom photo there, we used the Mo'u books again, both in English and in Burmese. That was very helpful. Um, and we wanted to make it as practical as possible. Um, and I, I think we did. The activities included presentations and demonstrations to equip them to really think about peace um, um, and to, to think about how mm, they could actually, what they and their students could do together, right, to pursue peace, right? Um, two of the participants, um, well, actually, there are 19 different departments that were represented. We had two participants from each of the departments. We had 11 graduate students as well, some of them from my previous workshop, which was exciting. Um, and um, I was really happy. I prepared a flash drive with 200 resources of peace building efforts in Myanmar, um, what's already being done, and peace building in education, articles and chapters. So we were able to leave them with some, some really good resources. So that, that was very exciting. All right. Um, I should say that the workshop was supported by a $4,000 grant from the United Board for Christian Higher Education in Asia. And um, they, only, they only did it through um, universities in Southeast Asia. So I partnered with Payap University in Thailand and I got the grant through that university. And I was able to take three doctoral students who were working on their PhDs in peace building. And they were from Myanmar, but pursuing their doctoral studies in Thailand. And I was able to pay the grant supported to take them back to Myanmar with me to launch these workshops. So it was amazing. Um, we did it both in, in English and in Burmese, and they had a lot of local knowledge that was just, and the people really, really responded to them, of course. You can see here, <clears throat> this is our, our final group. This was at the end of January of this year. Um, 
we had an evaluation and they responded to it. Um, all 40 responded that it was either excellent or good. They all said that. Um, these are some of the things they said that they learned. They had new knowledge on conflict, on structural violence, systemic violence, the importance of peace, of peace, the role of peace in education. They had a raised awareness of insights, they said, to solve problems, to discover their own ideas of what is peace and what is conflict, and new skills, strategies to apply peace building in their disciplines and methods to resolve conflict and active listening. So some of the exciting uh, things that the, the students said that they were learning. All right, so I'm, I'm watching my time here. Okay, so uh, just a couple more minutes. I just want to highlight. So sorry, oh, time is up. sorry about that. Yeah, almost time, right. So um, this is a book that is now under contract with Bloomsbury. Um, so I just wanted to, um, it, it, it's not done yet. I have all the chapters and I'm still editing it. What is, what is exciting about the book is that almost every chapter has a local person from Myanmar who is contributing to it. Um, so you can see some of the names and the titles here. Um, I hope that the book will uh, be published next year. If all goes well, <laughs> of course, COVID uh, hit and really impacted this, but everyone just got their chapters. And we even have, you can see um, a chapter dealing with youth in Rakhine State. So, um, and looking at the current state curriculum at middle school and how it supports or doesn't support peace. So very excited about this book that I'm editing with Bloomsbury that should be out um, next year. And so just uh, really quickly, these were just three articles I was able to publish recently about peace building in Myanmar. So you can see, wow, you know, wow, she had has a book and had three articles published and got more grants. But I want to end with this. Don't fear rejection, because my list of rejections is twice as long as my list of things I got accepted, right? These are, I just started here to show you. So um, I just want to say, keep your chin up, embrace rejection, because it strengthens your odds. All right, I think um, my time is probably up. So I'm going to send it over to the next speaker. And thank you so much for listening. All right, thank you, Mary. Um, let me just make sure that I am, oh, sorry. Perfect. All right, great. Um, yeah, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, in my presentation, I will talk about some of the research that I've done uh, throughout my Fulbright grant during these last two years. Um, and kind of looking at how to promote peace from a little different perspective. Um, so we are undoubtedly in an era of global public engagement um, where effective and sustainable public diplomacy um, and international education has become a really important driver um, of peace and mutual understanding. Um, however, upon closer examination, uh, you'll find that current public diplomacy models lack in taking into account um, the influence of language um, in international education. And so in my research, I focused on how current and dominant um, public diplomacy models reflect or don't reflect um, the role of language in cultural and public diplomacy and international education. So to give you a little bit more context, um, I'm an Austrian Fulbright grantee and I came to the US in fall of 2018 um, with a previous educational and professional background in translation and interpreting. So through my background and my um, various professional experiences um, in the field of translation, I saw firsthand that um, there are enormous challenges um, of translating culture specific terms um, from German to English, for example. And so this significantly shaped my understanding of the role of language um, in public diplomacy and it really made me want to pursue further research um, in the challenges that arise when there uh, is a breakdown in linguistic understanding among actors and what that means in the context of cultural and public diplomacy. Um, 
So throughout the last two years, uh, of course, my agenda for this presentation, I will quickly run over some of the research, the guiding research questions that I've kind of tackled. I'll give you a little bit of the theoretical background that I worked with. Um, I'll kind of talk about the case study that I um, that I researched, uh, the EU's public diplomacy efforts, um, and then just um, briefly talk about how uh, we can move forward from here or what the next questions might be. Um, so throughout the last two years, um, my research focused on kind of tackling these following questions. Uh, one, how is the role of language and linguistic diversity taken into account in current public diplomacy models? Um, two, how does language and particularly linguistic diversity influence public diplomacy efforts? And then three, how could existing public diplomacy models be improved? So um, these were the, the guiding questions that I asked as part of my um, research project with the goal of one, identifying um, more sustainable ways of reciprocal engagement among actors and two, um, challenging dominant US centric models in public diplomacy. So to set the scene a little bit more in terms of the theory um, I based my research that I based my research on, I'd like to give you a little bit more background information. Um, so throughout the last two years, I came across many different um, theoretical models of public diplomacy. And even though a um, universally accepted definition of public diplomacy doesn't really exist, um, there's general consensus among um, scholars and practitioners about some fundamental components of public diplomacy. And so a widely used and accepted model is um, Nicole's theory of public diplomacy, which argues that um, public diplomacy primarily consists of listening, advocacy, cultural diplomacy, exchanges, and international broadcasting, which are kind of the five main pillars. Um, and so these five main pillars have in common their reliance on um, successful communication between different groups of people, and that mostly happens in cross-cultural contexts. And of course, the challenges that cross-cultural communication brings with it, specifically in the context of public diplomacy, um, can often arise from cultural misunderstandings that are sometimes linked to um, language barriers or linguistic issues. And so that's really why I set out to um, examine the role and the influence of language on public diplomacy efforts. So upon my analysis of various public diplomacy models and adjacent concepts such as soft power, strategic communication, and nation branding, um, I came to the conclusion that none of these models include a dimension that deals with the potential ramifications of linguistic issues and um, breakdowns in communication. Um, and that's a very important observation, in my opinion, because when we think about all of the important, important elements and um, characteristics of good and effective and successful public diplomacy, we come to realize that it's all about two-way and reciprocal engagement and listening. And these goals are, of course, significantly impacted um, if we don't think about and conceptualize how linguistic challenges in these situations um, uh, of, of engagement can arise and also can be mitigated. And so therefore, um, I, I proposed as, as part of my research project um, to expand upon um, public diplomacy theory by considering um, linguistic anthropology theory. Uh, my goal was to offer a new perspective by including um, linguistic anthropology as a way of um, um, kind of expanding um, the, the theoretical framework um, in which the discussions of uh, public diplomacy usually take place. Um, and I thought that using this approach not only allows us to think about how the theoretical framework of linguistic anthropology can contribute to the theories of public diplomacy, but this approach also acknowledges the inextricable link between language and culture. And now before I go into how linguistic anthropology and public diplomacy contribute to one another, um, I just wanted to briefly define what linguistic anthropology is for you all. Um, so linguistic anthropology is the study of language as a cultural resource and speaking as a cultural practice. 
Um, and the goal of linguistic anthropology is to provide an understanding of the various aspects of language as a set of cultural practices. And so really this perception of humans as social actors and the underlying assumptions of how human interaction works and puts linguistic anthropology theory at the center of public diplomacy. And there are also three main points of connection between these two fields that I'd briefly like to point out. Um, first, really recognizing that, um, you know, language is a set of cultural practices that, and also a product um, of and the resource for social interaction is necessary because it helps us understand the culturally shaped exchanges um, of cross-cultural interactions um, that are taking place in at the heart of public diplomacy. Um, and then second, linguistic anthropology also emphasizes this aspect of mediation, um, and in particular cultural mediation between different social actors, um, which is reflected in the focus on mutuality in public diplomacy. And also third, uh, linguistic anthropology argues that language is never neutral and is constantly shaped by and used um, to construct a sense of cultural belonging uh, or cultural distance. And so this perspective is really important to consider uh, when engaging in public diplomacy efforts, as it can be a source of misunderstanding in cross-cultural interactions. And so as a next step, I kind of took these theoretical insights and um, chose to analyze the European Union as a case study uh, with the goal of approaching the analysis of public diplomacy efforts through this um, linguistic anthropology lens, um, hoping that it will allow me to kind of get a more holistic understanding of public diplomacy initiatives and offer more insights into the various aspects that should be considered when designing them. And so I chose to analyze the, uh, the EU's internal and the EU's, EU's external um, public diplomacy efforts and their relationship with the respective language policies um, of the EU. Um, and there were really two main reasons why I chose the EU. First, it's because the, you can argue that the creation of the EU is, is really one of the biggest um, public diplomacy successes in modern history. Um, due to its objective of fostering multilateralism um, in the aftermath of, of World War II. Um, and then even though initial European co cooperation um, aimed at achieving um, economic cohesion, this, this process kind of of leading to the construction of the EU was always motivated by a really strong sense um, that the future success of Europe would rely on political um, cooperation and, and mutual peace building. Um, and as such, this kind of supranational uh, nature of the EU really offers a unique opportunity to um, examine also calls theory of, of public diplomacy that consists of these five main elements um, and whether that can be applied to the, to the kind of um, supranational model that is outside of this realm of, of nation states. Um, and then also, of course, the EU's linguistic diversity uh, poses a multitude of different um, challenges to both successful EU diplomacy within the member states, but also abroad. Um, so that's kind of why I, why I chose the EU. And to, to, to wrap up this, um, this presentation, I just briefly wanted to um, outline the main takeaways um, from my analysis of, of the language policy um, on the internal and the external EU level, and also of the various EU public diplomacy tools that I analyzed, including the Eurobarometer, um, Erasmus+, Plus, the European External Action Service, and the EU strategy for international cultural relations. Um, but to keep this short and sweet, um, my analysis kind of showed that on the internal level, um, public diplomacy efforts have historically been a more, a more natural part of the fabric of the EU um, and place a clear emphasis on further integration, um, both using the EU's cultural and linguistic diversity. Um, but then thinking about this link between language and culture and the influence they have on one another um, by considering this, this theoretical overlap of linguistic anthropology and, culture, and public diplomacy, 
Um, I found in my analysis that the EU is trying to achieve uh, further EU integration, um, mostly through its multilingualism um, policy that's really at the heart and has always been at the heart of um, EU's history. But there is still a lot of room for improvement. Um, and similar, for example, to the International Cultural Relations Strategy that uh, Federica Mogherini established in 2016, um, one could create such a strategy and implement it on the EU's internal public diplomacy level, kind of serving as a starting point to coherently combine existing public diplomacy efforts in the EU um, and propose a more integrated approach um, that's inclusive of both the EU's linguistic and cultural diversity. Um, and this kind of strategy would facilitate not only the communication um, of public diplomacy messages, but also it would improve the understanding of the value of, of public diplomacy beyond economic benefits um, and higher employability among EU citizens. Um, and then it was interesting to see at the same time that this multilingualism policy, which really is a fundamental core element of the EU, um, is only minimally represented in the EU's external public diplomacy efforts. Um, it, this was even underlined in, an, in a report, in an official report um, by the EU, um, in which the um, operational uh, recommendations of the report um, specifically call for better integration of the multilingualism policy in the EU's external cultural relations. Um, but also it's really important to finally point out that um, there's a really, really fine line that can be crossed very easily between balancing member states' um, cultural sovereignty and also nation brand and their public diplomacy efforts individually, but then creating a more integrated approach of public diplomacy that critics, critics argue could, could result in kind of a United States of Europe. Um, so to kind of wrap this up, I, I found that there is a really insufficient understanding of the challenges um, that linguistic and cultural diversity brings with it in public diplomacy in current models. And um, Federica Mogherini said in one of her speeches in 2016 that our cultures are bound to meet and we have a duty to make the most of this encounter. And I strongly believe that acknowledging the um, interconnectedness of language and culture and promoting a more holistic public diplomacy approach would be the first step in fulfilling this duty. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to taking your questions. Sarah? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today and for the other panelists for their fascinating presentations. Give me just one minute, please. Okay, can you all see the slides? Are we good? Okay, I'm gonna just jump in. So today I have um, Amara Raymond and Miley Nguyen with me as well. We are joining you globally um, from all across the US and the world. And uh, we're gonna talk about promoting peace and justice through English language instruction. All three of us either formerly or currently were English teaching assistants through um, Fulbright. And we're gonna talk about how we um, incorporated peace and justice into our um, roles as ETAs. Miley? Um, yeah, can you hear me? All right. So uh, keeping in mind our time limit, um, I'll just quickly go over the contents of our presentation. Um, first, we'll have a brief 
introduction about what we're going to talk about. And Sarah will then speak on thinking critically about English as a global language and her experience in Morocco. And next, I will sort of talk about prioritizing and contextualizing um, English language instruction, specifically in, um, in my experience teaching in South Korea. And finally, um, Amara will focus in on her experience teaching civil rights and incorporating diverse examples in her classroom. So English uh, is a language of self-expression uh, that is ultimately the purpose of our communication. Um, in other countries, that's not always the case. Um, when I was getting my uh, TEFL certification in Japan, for example, um, we were taught that the primary function of language is to maintain social relationships. So neither function is right or wrong, but we need to be conscientious as English teachers about how the differing functions of language can impact uh, anti-bias education dialogue specifically. Um, and we need to sort of recognize that English teaching has a history of colonization and um, we need to recognize our privilege um, as foreign educators when we talk about um, topics of peace and justice and anti-bias with diverse students. Great, so I'm gonna share about um, how I approached this in Morocco. So to share a little bit about the context, um, in Morocco, I was teaching advanced English seminars at a university in Rabat. And one of the courses I was given to teach was called English Civilization. When I got that course titled, I wonder, what does this really mean? And my department told me that I should focus on British and American culture. And uh, I asked them if they would also allow me to include a unit on English as a global language. Um, as Miley pointed out, there's the history of colonization. And one of our keynote speakers yesterday urged us to consider decolonizing everything. And so I really wanted to, of course, share about American culture, but also challenge my students to um, consider the English language from a critical perspective and specifically its relationship with power. In Morocco, this is something that um, they're used to thinking about because they were colonized by the French. And so they're very sensitive to the relationship between the French language and power, but do not as frequently make that connection with English because it has a more positive connotation. Um, because studying English over French means that you're not prioritizing the colonizer. Um, but still, I, I felt like their grasp on the English language and its relationship with power was a bit flat. And as a Fulbrighter, I really wanted to challenge them to kind of think in a new way. And so one of the ways that I did that um, was challenging them to think about who does the English language belong to? Um, looking at countries where English is the official language or countries that have a majority of um, native English speakers, my students were really surprised to see how vast this list is. And part of how I uh, encouraged them to think more globally about English was to pick a country that was not Australia, not in the UK, not in North America, and come to class regularly with updates on that country. Um, and, and so they could expand their understanding of the English language as, as well as expanding their understanding of the various countries um, where English is spoken. Um, this was uh, an, a quote from an article that we um, discussed within class. And I just want to read this quote because it's very gripping. It says the largest English speaking nation in the world, the United States, has only about 20% of the world's English speakers. In Asia alone, an estimated 350 million people speak English, which is about the same as the combined English speaking populations of Britain, the United States, and Canada. This is so striking and was especially important to me to point this out to my students as someone who kind of looks like the stereotype of what they consider to be an English speaker or even an American and helping my students to see that 
um, people who look like me actually represent the minority of English speakers globally and challenging them to think of connecting with the world through English, not just with the United States. This led to a lot of very interesting discussion about language, power, and diversity. And um, one question that we considered is, how is the US diverse linguistically? How does the US um, embrace or not that linguistic diversity? And comparing that to Morocco, um, which is an extremely diverse nation linguistically and is actually far ahead of the U US in terms of acknowledging more minority languages um, in Morocco. Berber um, is actually listed as an official language, even though it's a, a, a language that's spoken by the minority of their population. Um, and so my students often had this idea that the US was diverse, but Morocco was not. Um, and it was very enlightening to really think critically about how we define diversity. And with Fulbright as cultural ambassadors um, and trying to build mutual understanding, part of how we do that is by getting into the complexity of these stereotypes, even positive stereotypes, such as the US being um, a diverse place on the linguistic front. Actually, Morocco was ahead of us. And that's just one way that um, as an ETA, I tried to really acknowledge um, the power dynamics and incorporate more peace and justice into the curriculum. Um, all right, so I am going to be sort of narrowing the scope um, of English instruction to specifically anti-bias education um, in the English classroom. Um, so first, I want to talk about prioritizing students' needs in the English classroom. Um, questions you should ask yourself if you are interested in anti-bias education in your classroom is, what do you want your students to take away from your anti-bias lessons? And how can we make our lessons accessible to students of varying English levels? Because if you're talking about topics of that may be like race, racism and oppression, ableism, sexism, things like that. Um, having, being able to communicate effectively is really important because if you are talking about these issues but your students aren't understanding you, it can sometimes do more harm than good. So next, um, avoiding white or woke saviorism. So. I am a relatively new teacher. I came to South Korea as a brand new teacher. I've never taught English before. I had a very grand idea of what it was going to be like to be a teacher in the classroom. Um, I learned very quickly that that was not, it's very different from my expectations, but um, as Fulbrighters, uh, we inherently have a lot of privilege in our roles as educators in a foreign country. And um, specifically as English teachers, we have a lot of privilege growing up in an English speaking country and speaking English naturally. Um, in anti-bias education, it can be easy to fall into the trap of teaching what makes us feel good, um, what makes us feel woke, um, maybe to post on social media, like, hey, I've just taught this really amazing lesson um, without really considering what your students need. Um, you may have heard this expression, the sage on the stage or the guide on the side. Um, with language instruction, we we need to remember that we are communicating with our students in their second language, maybe their third or fourth. Um, and sometimes lectures are not the best method to engage our students about anti-bias topics. Um, so how can we encourage our students to express their own opinions openly instead of preaching our opinions to them? This is a very important question that I regularly have to ask myself before I make any of my lessons. Um, sometimes I use a Socratic method, but We'll get later. Um, so some things to consider, um, building trust. So we are short-term visitors in our students' classrooms. And I, that's super important to remember um, because these difficult conversations need to be built on relationships of trust, especially if we want our students to express themselves openly. Um, and the anti-bias lessons will be more fruitful if we uh, build a, and cultivate a culture of respect and safety and understanding in our classroom. 
and cultural contexts, uh, we are likely not from the same background as our students. And this can change how we understand the context of oppression in our host communities. Um, for example, my Korean students and I have very different mental images when we hear the word police officer. We have a very different relationship um, in our own communities. Uh, language level, it, it's important to have the vocabulary to discuss social justice, but um, my mentality is that sometimes it's more important to understand the big ideas than to, um, it's more important that my students understand the big ideas and are compelled to talk about these topics outside of the classroom than it is for them to be able to spell the word discrimination in English specifically. Um, and last, uh, promoting action. While it, we want to encourage discussion in the classroom, it's very pertinent that our lessons encourage action outside of the classroom, uh, large or small. And I want them to, I want my students to feel engaged in these topics and to want to talk about them in their hosts, in, in their communities. Um, and by making the lesson relevant to their experience, not my experience. So teaching about racism in a racially homogenous community. Um, I am a member of Fulbright or Fulbridge, um, which is a organization of like Fulbrighters, alumni. Um, mostly we're active on Instagram. And I put out a question about what ETAs were really interested in talking about um, before they were, wanted to teach anti-bias education materials in their classroom. And this was the number one topic that they were very concerned about. So the problem is, is that it can be hard for students to understand racism on a systemic level if they have never interacted with someone outside of their race. Um, I, in Korea, I've had students tell me that racism does not exist in South Korea, uh, which I know is incredibly false, but, out of my 1,000 students, I teach at a, a fairly big school here. Um, no, most of them have never interacted with a, another person of color other than another Asian person. They are all Asian. There are no mixed students. They are all Asian. So they don't really, they may have never seen a black person in their life. Um, so a potential solution that I have been sort of experimenting with in my classroom is context. Context is key. Everyone understands oppression in some way, whether or not they have the vocabulary to describe it. So when introducing oppression, I talk about, um, I have two students in my class uh, that use wheelchairs. And using those, um, the, the examples of ableism and disability, um, my students can see how their peers struggle to participate in certain class activities and are completely left behind in other school-wide events. And they can identify the hardship their peers face, they can empathize with the struggle, they can recognize their own privilege, and they can hopefully apply this to other oppression as well. Uh, so very quickly, uh, using pop culture to contextualize oppression. Um, as an ETA, this is something maybe that <laughs> we're all familiar with is using cultural examples uh, to get our students interested in English. Um, so personalizing your lessons. Uh, this is actually a tweet that I used in a lesson with my students. Um, it's, so again, I teach in South Korea, so everyone knows BTS. Everyone is familiar with the very famous K-pop group. Um, they sent out this tweet earlier this year, um, right after the death of George Floyd. Um, the tweet is in Korean and it's in English. So it allows my students to understand the message while also un learning new English words. Um, and I use this tweet to introduce uh, racial discrimination and Black Lives Matter. And we were able to have a discussion about how Korean people view Black Lives Matter as a movement and how the movement in America was progressing at the time um, and is still progressing. And showing their role models as people who care about things um, like discrimination is super, super helpful uh, because it contextualizes Black Lives Matter as not just a, an American phenomenon, but something that has a global impact. And I put a link down here for Fullbridge, uh, again, a plug for Fullbridge. Um, 
there is an anti-bias education resource page, resource page that was um, put together earlier this year. And if you wanna check it out, what I'd recommend. <laughs> and so last, very, very, very quickly, um, some last tips in the classroom that I found that is helpful when talking about anti-bias education engage different opinions. Um, maybe your students don't have the same opinions as you. Obviously you want to model the behavior and respect that you want your students to treat each other with. Um, check for understanding, make sure your students aren't just regurgitating these terms. Again, um, more harm than good sometimes. And include activities. So engaging students by doing games and activities and not just passive listening. And that's a really good segue into Amara's section. All right, building off my previous panelist, when we're talking about how to teach about racism abroad, I really made it a priority to include as many examples about race and diversity within um, the curriculum that I was teaching. So everything that I did focused on some part of civil rights or race, racism in America or diversity in America even if it wasn't on MLK day or during Black History Month or during maybe another specific holiday, all of my units and almost all of my lessons incorporated some component of racism in America, diversity in America, or teaching directly about the civil rights movement in America. So one example is that on MLK day, I had introduced my students, this is a lesson plan that I did, I introduced my students to MLK. I didn't necessarily always have the technology ability in my classroom in Indonesia. So I printed out a couple pictures of uh, MLK and put, put it around the board. And I asked my students if they knew who was on the board, if they've ever seen this person, if they've ever heard of this person, have they ever seen this picture? And none of my students knew who MLK or who the picture on the board was. And so then I had, I created a timeline of MLK's life with significant events where he was born, maybe what he did throughout his life, the Civil Rights Act, and then also his assassination. And I cut out these couple sentences, maybe they were 10 with the timeline and dates, and I taped them all around the room. And this is where we had our dictation race. I put the students in partners. One student was the runner and they would run around the room and gather all the sentences and report back to whoever was the writer. And together they would write out the timeline based off the 10 sentences around the room and try to figure out what happened first, what happened next, and what happened last. This did help us practice our uh, past tense as well, because this is what we were doing, the unit was during the past tense unit. Um, and it was a fun, interactive, engaging way to get them running. After I, they all collected their sentences, they figured out the order. While they figured out the order, I had students come up to the board as well and write out what they thought sentence one, two, three, et cetera, were. And so it was also giving them the opportunity to come up to the board, write down their sentences and try to talk out what we thought the timeline of MLK's life was. While we were doing the timeline and walking through each step, I tried to explain like what the civil rights movement was. If my sentence said, in 1964, the bill was passed, it was signed. I tried to explain what that meant. I tried to explain the March on Washington. What was that? Why was that significant? And before that, I tried to explain too, why was this bill necessary in America? Why was this bill, why did this March on Washington happen? And all of those talking points actually occurred throughout the timeline that I used for my students. So they already were familiar with it as we were going over it together, I would just, throw in a couple of sentences afterwards, telling them why this was important, what was happening in America at the time. Lastly, we ended the class, I printed out a speech of I have a dream, I printed out the speech of I have a dream, and I took out all the verbs and I put them in parentheses for my students to write in the correct tense for the verb. So it was also, we incorporated this listening activity. Additional examples, yeah, we can go to the next slide. Uh, for International Education Week, I had my students watch Remember the Titans, and I did a whole presentation about segregation in America before watching Remember the Titans. I talked about what it meant in America to have white Americans in one place and black Americans in another place. I talked about public bathrooms, restaurants, uh, parks, schools, and it was a great segue into now them seeing a movie that talked about well, what happens when this football team becomes integrated. And again, for International Education Week, the sky's the limit. I could have done anything. I could have shown them Aladdin. I mean, that's a movie that's in English as well. But I really want to emphasize that I made it a priority 
to try to include as many examples of diversity and racism as I could. Additionally, during our heroes unit in Indonesian curriculum, in the book, there's a unit on heroes. And unfortunately, in the book, there's only white examples of heroes in the book. And some of them also include like um, some Indonesian history as well. But beyond that, there's nothing else. And so I introduced them to Muhammad Ali. And for me, this was fantastic because my students were all Muslim in the classroom and they knew and they had heard of Muhammad Ali. And I explained again, why he was my hero, what he contributed to America, why is he seen as a civil rights hero as well in America. Again, for this heroes unit, I could have said anyone, someone that maybe isn't necessarily the most diverse example, but is still a hero to me. But I made it a priority to really include these examples that talked about the diversity in America. You can also introduce diversity within anything that you do. So if you don't, if you definitely, if you don't necessarily feel comfortable talking about civil rights or talking about Indigenous Peoples Day or MLK Day, or you want to do these units on segregation, you could also just create these worksheets. So this is a worksheet I created. We were going over our daily activities after we did our introduction unit. And I created this worksheet to include um, verbs of people doing like going, putting on their makeup, taking a shower, or going to school. And then I had the students draw out their own vocab words. And what I noticed was that as they were drawing out their own vocabulary for different action verbs, they were referencing the, the, the worksheet I made. And the worksheet I made was filled with POC examples. And this is just one example, but I had different POC examples um, on this worksheet. And then the students were starting to draw the same way. And then for another, like even in this worksheet, you can't exactly see, but I noticed that my students started putting hijabs on their characters as well, because a lot of my students wore hijabs. And so it was really, it's really important to reinforce that, like include, if you're talking about English to make sure that even your characters on your worksheet are not, are, are POC and not just white. Um, and this is just another example of, again, if you don't necessarily feel comfortable talking about civil rights, segregation, the boycotts, um, maybe even police violence in the US, well, you can incorporate diversity just by even teaching verbs or activities uh, abroad. So lastly, just to summarize everything I said, I really encourage you to make it a priority to include non-white people in all of your lessons, not just a unit or not just the month of February or not just a holiday, but to really incorporate um, POCs in everything that you do. Um, and I really tried to even the videos that I showed my students or even the podcast that I had them do um, or even any listening activities to include different accents in the US. I wanted them to hear like, this is what someone from the South could sound like. This is what someone from maybe New York sounds like. Just again, to reinforce this idea that white people are not the, um, the hierarchy when it comes to speaking English and they're not the only example, but there are all these other examples of people speaking English as well. So thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us, uh, throw them in the chat here. I really appreciate uh, your time and for listening to us. Thank you. Is it time for me to start? Okay, hi everyone. Um, I want to thank the other panelists for letting me share this panel with them on education, peace, and social justice. These are all goals that the Fulbright trips have had and will continue to have. It's also very much an honor to be here with you today. Hi everyone, my name is Mary Ann Stanton. Thank you for joining my presentation, Building Bridges Between People with Fulbright Travel. I'm going to explain how Fulbright trips are unique, the future diversity of our trips, and end with an example of our most recent trip to Thailand. Fulbright trips are many Fulbrights minus the grant. Our trips are tightly aligned to the mission of Fulbright to exchange knowledge and create mutual understanding among cultures. Both of these are very powerful forces of peace. Our trips dive below the surface of the country, connect with Fulbright alumni and grantees in the country, during which we exchange knowledge and make connections. We also provide service projects to work with locals on most of our trips, not all of them. And we often have 
receptions with the Fulbright Commission and government officials. They are definitely memorable experiences. And once you've traveled with us, um, I think you will agree with one of our participants who said, "Woo! after this trip, I'm never traveling with anyone except Fulbright. During the suspension of our trips due to the pandemic, we have been working behind the scenes to enrich and improve the travel program. COVID-19 has exposed a profound injustice in the United States with a shocking inequality of health and health care. The pandemic is affecting more black, indigenous and people of color with a higher rate of illness and death. This intersects powerfully with the more well-known inequalities in education, policing, employment, salaries and housing that marginalized populations have been experiencing for decades. Although our previous trips have addressed the injustices of other countries, some of our future trips are focusing on outreach to our own communities in the United States and working more directly towards social justice. Currently, we are developing an insight trip to the Cherokee Nation and in this trip, we will explore Cherokee arts, culture, and environment. Although this trip is currently in the developmental stages and at a stoppage due to the fact that a lot of illness of the elders is taking place with COVID in the Cherokee Nation, I do want to share with you what is being planned. One, an in-depth exploration of the history of the Cherokee Nation. The Cherokees have a lot to be proud of. Their schools were established soon after relocation. They have a written language and they have been maintaining a very large tribal membership. Second, visits to the Cherokee institutions in the Northeast of Oklahoma. Third, seminars by faculty from Northeast Oklahoma State University. Fourth, a visit to a Cherokee school where the children are taught in the Cherokee language. Five optional classes in basket weaving, which by the way, is an art for which the Cherokees are very well known and also in jewelry making. Six, the tricks, excuse me, the trip participants will give presentations about Fulbright and definitely encourage um, applying for Fulbright grants. Last, there will be a possible one day river canoe trip in the hilly and forested area, area of Northeast Oklahoma. Once travel is safe again, according to the Center for Disease Control and Pre Prevention and according to the World Health Organization, this trip will be finalized. The travel program is also moving forward on lower cost trips for young professionals and students. Although our trips have always been high quality for lower than market price points, we are diversifying to enable more Fulbrights and friends of Fulbright to join us in continuing the Fulbright mission domestically and internationally. This diversity will also continue to reinforce the positive brand of Fulbright. To give you an idea of our international trips, I would like to tell you about our last trip in January 2020 to Chiang Mai, Thailand, where we taught English to grades two through six at a school for underserved students. For five days, we taught large classes, interacted with teachers, and made a lifelong impression on the pupils. The last day was a round robin game day during which we had balloon relay games, line dancing, word games, crafts, and a lot of fun. At the end of the day, the students presented traditional Thai dances for us. And we, the we being Thai students, Thai teachers, administrators, and the Fulbright trip participants, we all danced together the Cupid Shuffle. It was so <laughs> enjoyable. We shared our cultures through music and dance. The students gave me and other trip participants thank you cards that they had made of their own initiatives. Their teachers had nothing to do with that. When we left, the students formed a people tent for us to walk through and gave us high fives as we left to our vans. The students were sad to see us leave, some with tears. In addition to this service, we learned a lot about 
some of, not all, but some of Thailand's social issues. We visited a woman's correctional facility, an orphanage, a self-sustaining community for abused women and their children. One afternoon, we had afternoon tea at the American consulate with the consul general, Sean O'Neill, with the, full, the Thailand Fulbright executive director, Benjuanyu Bronsri, with the Fulbright Thailand outreach officer, Chotima Chetawan, one grantee and seven Fulbright alumni. We also enjoyed the highlights of Thai culture, such as massages, we really liked those, <laughs> markets and delicious food. Finally, we did have some fun. We visited an elephant camp where we played with and washed elephants. And I would like to show you, whoops, I would like to show you some slides. Um, Whoops, I think I'm gonna skip them for time. Anyway, so I'm gonna ask you, how do we build bridges domestically and internationally with Fulbright travel? First, we travel with fellow alumni and friends of Fulbright, a group who shares the same values and with whom we instantly form a camaraderie. During Fulbright trips, lifetime friendships are made, professional connections are established, and profound mutual understandings of people and their cultures are increased. More importantly, peaceful bridges are built that hold strongly into the future. So what are we doing going forward? We are diversifying with outreach to underserved populations in our own country. And we are diversifying our trips to include less expensive ones for young professionals. I look forward to traveling with you in the future, thank you for your time and, and interest. And now Stacy Dixon will address questions. Thank you, Marianne, and thank you to all of our panelists. This has been a, a fruitful and wonderful time together. We have just a couple of minutes in which we could uh, address some of the questions. There's a question uh, to Marianne about the Fulbright trips and whether or not Fulbrighters can bring family members and what are the age limits? Sorry, so our trips are open to friends of Fulbright and to family members of the Fulbright alumni or the friend of Fulbright who joins the trip. And we actually had a 10 year old on our trip to Thailand in January. We do have concerns that when there are younger children that they are, they are watched carefully by their parents um, or their trap, the, the adult that's traveling with them, but yes. Thank you. Once again, thank you to our panel and thank you to those of, that attended this. This was an incredibly, incredibly meaningful presentation, not just because of the topic, but because of the wonderful takeaways that we were given to work with. Thank everyone for attending and this concludes session four.